Hey folks, it's Nate. Thanks for joining me at the Art Table again today. I want to talk a little bit about the dark side of copyright law. Now, I've talked a lot about copyright law on this channel before, and I am not an expert, but even I can see that it clearly has a lot of good and bad effects on creative work. It is the primary way that creative people ensure that they can profit from the work they put into their creations. However, many parts of copyright law are quite murky, especially as regards international relations. I discussed this a little bit when I talked about the copyright strikes filed against anti-tubers by Japanese animation companies in the past. We're going to talk about something kind of related to that today, and that is the difficulty of dealing with false claimants, especially those who cross international borders. Now, this is distinct from the problem with anime. In that case, the Japanese companies filing claims probably, again, not an expert, but probably have some kind of claim under Japanese copyright law, which is very, very restrictive as compared to, say, United States copyright law or British copyright law. And in general, as I said when I discussed not letting yourself be used as filler, I believe in aggressive protection of your copyright laws. Other people do not have the right to speak for how your materials are distributed. However, this only applies in cases where you have a legitimate claim to your copyright. A transformative fair use work, of course, you no longer hold the copyright to. Now, the line between a transformative work and straight up pirating of a work can sometimes be blurry, but it is still a legal debate to be had. What is not a legal debate is filing a copyright claim for IPs that you have no right to at all. And that is what I want to talk about today. It is a not unheard of practice to file copyright claims against people you don't like in an attempt to simply take away their platform to speak on the internet. Social media platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and etc. all have a difficulty in policing their platforms for copyrighted content. Technically, they don't have a legal obligation to do that at the present. However, they still have an interest in doing it, A, because it keeps users on their platform, and B, because it avoids regulation that may mandate they regulate copyrighted content in a way they do not like. In fact, that kind of regulation does exist to a limited extent in the form of the DMCA, or the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Again, I'm not an expert on the legal ins and outs of this particular piece of law. However, I do know that many social media platforms go above and beyond the requirements of that law in an attempt to make sure they comply fully with it beyond a shadow of a doubt, and furthermore to avoid further onerous regulation like the DMCA from coming down and tying their hands in how they deal with their platform. I get where this comes from. Nobody wants somebody looking over their shoulder telling them what they have to do. The problem in this comes at the intersection of the anonymity of the internet and the severity of the remedies necessary to deal with copyright infringement. Today's case study for this is the writer John Del Arroz, or Arroz. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce that. If you know, I'm sure you'll correct me down in the comments, as you have in the past. Anyway, John Del Arroz is running a Kickstarter campaign that is a parody of another one of his Kickstarter campaigns. Yes, this is a, a little strange, but I, I respect the hustle, all things considered. Del Arroz is not only making fun of his own work, he is also playing off some tropes established in what is known as the isekai genre. This is a genre that largely originates from Japan and is a derivative of portal fiction. I'm not going to get too deep into the tropes here, just realized that the title of Del Arroz's campaign and many of the tropes explored in it are parodies of the isekai genre. Parody is, of course, protected by the First Amendment. It is fair use. Furthermore, it is actually quite a lot of work to do a good parody, perhaps more so than making a work of original fiction, especially in the isekai genre, which is pretty derivative, at least as of right now. Add in the fact that the primary work that Del Arroz is parodying is a work he wrote himself, and it's very difficult to see any kind of clear, solid copyright case to be made against him. Yet, Del Arroz's most recent campaign has been suspended for copyright claims repeatedly. 
Another independent comic creator by the name of Liam Gray has repeatedly filed copyright claims with Indiegogo and gotten Del Araz's campaign suspended. Gray has done this not so much because there is something wrong or copyright infringing in Del Araz's work, but because there is personal grudges between the two of them. I can't say anything about these personal grudges because they've been going on for a long time, by all accounts, and I kind of tuned both of these creators out of my social media feeds because they created a lot of drama. By all accounts, Del Araz does this because he is a full-time troll, and I can kind of respect that. That is necessary in some fields to get attention, but I find it kind of boring after about, oh, 10 or 15 minutes, so I muted both of these creators and went on with my life. So I can't really speak to who's on what side of the beef between the two of these. What I can say is that Liam is abusing the copyright system in a way that is very, very negative for any person who wants to be a full-time creator. Again, when used correctly, the copyright law is in place so that a creator can benefit from the things they create and prevent others from stealing them. Theft of copyrighted work is no small thing, nor is it a recent problem. We can go back as far as Charles Dickens and discover people who were losing income, income they badly needed, because there were people in other countries basically pirating their work and making a profit from it without sharing any with the original creator. The problem we run into is one of international boundaries. Dickens' books were copied and sold in America by unscrupulous publishers who shared none of the revenue with them. He had no remedy because the United States was pretty hostile to Britain at the time, and there was no way that he could file something in, the, in British courts and get American courts to respect them. Today, the difficulties are a little more complex. Del Araz cannot just file a defamation suit against Liam Gray. Liam is actually taking advantage of a method created to deal with copyright claims. Indiegogo, the platform where all of this is taking place, has no clear-cut way to deal with someone who abuses the copyright system. They have no penalties built into their reporting structure. Furthermore, Liam is located in Australia, which makes any kind of court proceeding incredibly difficult. I think most of the responsibility for these difficulties does fall on Indiegogo. They have created a way for people to harass and destroy the projects of others with very little consequence to themselves. I understand that this was not what Indiegogo intended to do when they created their copyright claim system. They were attempting to respect the rights of creators to monetize and distribute their own content and forbid others from doing the same. Again, I think that's very important and admirable. However, clearly the system they have in place is not sufficient to the current situation. So what can be done to make this a little bit easier for everyone to navigate? I want to start by offering two distinct solutions, one of which is something authors can do, and the other of which is something that Indiegogo can do, and both of these things actually mesh together. What I suggest is that authors file for copyright. Now, anyone who creates something has the copyright to their creation automatically. Copyright law just assumes that if you write a story or a song or a piece of music, you know, an, an instrumental without lyrics or something like that, you will automatically claim that copyright. So it assumes that you are retaining that copyright and you can pr prosecute people who violate that copyright without filing any paperwork to establish your ownership of that copyright. However, actually filing for the copyright, registering your work with the government to say, hey, yes, this is mine and I intend to defend my rights to it, you create a paper trail with an independent, neutral third party. And again, you can file for these copyrights with the U.S. government using copyright.gov. I am sure that other governments offer this kind of service to their citizens as well. I don't know of any private solutions for copyright management, since the primary way to establish that you are a copyright holder is to show your work to a third party and then have that third party attest that, yes, this is something you created. I would assume there would be a private way to establish that kind of copyright ownership. But since copyright is something that is so often adjudicated by the government, 
it seems like most places have just left it in the hands of government bureaucracies that handle copyright and trademark services rather than try and set up a redundant third party that does that. And there's a whole lot of arguments you could make about that. I'm not really interested in them right now. My point is that by registering for this trademark, you have something that very clearly states that, yes, this is mine. The other half of this is that Indiegogo and other platforms like it should have the option to file with your copyright information included in a campaign to prove that, yes, you own the copyright to whatever you are trying to sell. With your copyrights clearly established by a third party before you begin the campaign, Indiegogo or other similar services will then know they can simply ignore any copyright claim filed against a specific project. This is not an ideal workaround, admittedly. However, just about any other solution has too many workarounds or too many hurdles to overcome in international law to really be practical. Del Araz cannot sue Gray in Australian courts. He has no standing. Indiegogo cannot simply ban Liam Gray's account. He can always make a new one, taking full advantage of the anonymity of the Internet. Other potential solutions, such as Indiegogo requiring some kind of money be put forward before a copyright claim is filed, and then taking that money as a fine from somebody if their copyright proves to be invalid, doesn't seem very fair to creators with legitimate copyright claims to take to Indiegogo. By giving campaign creators the opportunity to prove they are the legitimate owners of the property they are selling before they offer it on Indiegogo, using some kind of official certification from, say, a government copyright board or copyright office, then we are looking at something that seems pretty fair. These are not expensive procedures to do. In fact, I think it's free in the United States. It's clearly legal under the jurisdiction of the place that is issuing that copyright. And it heads all of this off at the pass. A person who has a legitimate copyright claim can simply say, yes, this is legitimately my stuff. I've taken the steps to prove it. And anyone who comes to you and says it isn't is lying to you. It's not a perfect solution, but there are no perfect solutions in a world full of people who will always try and exploit a system. Anyway, that's what I got for you today. Hopefully you found that interesting. Let me know how you might approach dealing with false copyright claims on a platform like Indiegogo down in the comments below. There's a like button and a subscribe button down there. You can use those as you see fit, and I will talk to you